Hello watch enthusiasts! As wristwatch wearers, we often take for granted some of the most key components and technologies we see in wristwatches and, and pocket watches alike. And so in today's video I'd like to speak about five innovations and technologies which have been produced for a number of years and certainly the range of, of age is quite staggering amongst these five different components, but which play an enormous role in almost every watch that, that one sees to some degree uh, greater or lesser. And so this can, includes a variety of different technologies, from key components to the escapement of a watch, to some technologies which one rarely thinks about, like the sapphire crystal on the front of a piece. But amongst all of these technologies, the one shared characteristic is that they play an immense role in daily use of a wristwatch, and are components which we often take for granted, in terms of providing a great deal in terms of the resilience of a watch, its, its ability to survive the elements, and also to tell accurate time consistently. And so unsurprisingly, I begin with a technology seen in the vast majority, and really the overwhelming vast majority of mechanical watches, with only a few real oddities coming out aside from this particular technology. And this is the balance spring. And the balance spring really is a key component to a mechanical watch, because it replaces the pendulum in, the, in a normal conventional clock. And it functions by being attached to the balance wheel, which if you've looked through the back of a, a wristwatch before, you'll recognise this as the wheel which oscillates back and forth. And this replaces that motion of a pendulum, and thus allows the, the watch to be able to keep regular time, and thus controls the release of energy from the spring to be able to allow the hands to, to run at the correct rate. Now this is attached to the escapement as well, which is what locks and unlocks, and allows this, uh, this gradual release of the energy in the spring. And though I, I explain the escapement later on in this video, this component is absolutely key to the release of energy at a constant rate. Now the creation of this key component was long shrouded in a certain amount of mystery, because there was a long-standing debate as to whether Robert Hooke, the English scientist, or Christian Huygens, the Dutchman, first invented this technology. However, recent scholarship suggests that in fact it was Robert Hooke, the English scientist, in, in approximately 1670, who invented this technology. And I would encourage you to read uh, an article by SJX Watches to, uh, to learn more, because it's a really fascinating article, I'll put it in the description down below, um, which describes this, this uh, discovery more, more in depth. But suffice it to say that Robert Hooke's invention of this, this concept of the balance spring was a two-part technology and something which was, uh, was not really the modern form that one might imagine, whereas Huygens' answer to this technology, which was, uh, was, was finally finalised in 1675, five years after Hooke, was far more akin to a modern technology. In this sense, it was a single coiled spring which sat within the balance wheel and thus allowed this, this oscillation to, to, to happen in a very similar function as you would see with a pendulum and thus allowed this technology to become something, something key and something crucial in later centuries to portable timekeeping. And following the creation of this technology and the general establishment of its form, I would say the next most major innovation in the, the evolution of this spring was Breguet's re-engineering of its shape in 1795. Now, of course, this was a long period later, and Breguet was a truly legendary watchmaker, and he created the overcoil, the Breguet overcoil. And the function of this was to have a, a loop of, of spring going over the top of the rest of the, the spring, and this allowed uh, an increased isochronism. And what this means is that with previous springs, and indeed uh, a lot of springs which don't have this technology, the, the, uh, the, the amount of wind in the springs, the amount of energy the spring has to give, and the varying in the, uh, the torque which it's giving, changes the amplitude of the motion of the balance wheel. And what this means is that the balance wheel would, uh, would change the amount it would turn, so the number of degrees it would rotate or move would change depending upon the torque being applied, whereas this allowed the, the balance wheel to move in a more constant motion and thus give more regular timekeeping. Now where modern balance springs are concerned, the vast majority of brands, due to the immensely small tolerances these have to be made to, don't produce their own springs. And this means there are several large players in the industry who either produce their own springs or produce springs for a larger number of manufacturers. And really, Niverox, the ETA, um, or rather Swatch Group owned producer of these springs, has become uh, one of the most widely used. And they use an iron and uh, a nickel based alloy for, the, for their springs, which means they are ferrous, and so as a result, they are affected by magnetism. For a fair while, though, we've seen a number of other solutions to, to balance springs from wealthier and larger producers and, uh, and owners of watch brands. So for example, from Rolex, since the early 2000s, we've seen parachrom hair springs, which come in this blue coloration with that Breguet uh, overcoil, and are non-magnetic and also much more shock resistant than one sees from Niverox ones. 
And so one can see how these um, uh, the, these brands, depending upon their wealth, can, can make uh, changes to what they use. Also from the Swatch Group, one has seen a very large emphasis on, on silicon parts. And silicon really is the dream material for these things being completely um, uh, unmetallic. And so as a result, it's able to, uh, to behave very differently to a metallic spring. However, at the present time, this use of silicon is largely controlled by Rolex, Patek Philippe and the Swatch Group, which means that, for example, um, groups such as the Richemont Group, which did try to include some silicon in, uh, in models from Beaumont Mercier, found after a year they had to discontinue this um, for a number of legal reasons. But certainly in future we're going to see a very different set landscape in terms of the different springs used, because there has been a very major announcement from the Swatch Group, in collaboration with Audemars Piguet, that they're going to be using a, a new material called Nivacron, and Nivacron is a titanium-based alloy which is cheaper than silicon, but non-magnetic. And this should allow the Swatch Group to furnish their less expensive brands with similarly amagnetic springs. And whilst they, uh, they, they are affecting this sort of technology, their more expensive brands are also now adopting silicon springs, as Omega has for the, the last few years, and with great success indeed, with their 15,000 Gauss anti-magnetic watches. However, in any form, it's certainly undeniable this spring plays an integral role to the operation of a mechanical movement, and really is something which I think we do take for granted, in terms of being something so enormously crucial. The second technology and innovation I'd like to speak about is the lever escapement. And the lever escapement is another incredibly important and successful innovation in the watch industry, and something which dates back to around 1750, with the invention of this technology by Thomas Mudge. But to really understand this, one has to, to look at what preceded the escapement um, of the lever variety, but also what the escapement does. And the escapement works in, uh, in function with the balance wheel, and indeed that balance spring which you just saw, which oscillates back and forth. And what the escapement means, and, and what it performs, is that it locks and unlocks in order to gradually release the energy of the spring. And so this is regulated by the movement of that balance wheel, but uh, the, the escapement really is the technology which, uh, which is able to convert that oscillation into the gradual release of energy. But what you see on the screen now is an ancestor of the lever escapement, and really what came before it, and I do speak in terms of escapements which operated with a balance wheel, rather than clock escapements such as anchor escapements which operated with a pendulum. But this technology was so what one might call the, the verge escapement, and the verge escapement was a more basic form of escapement which wasn't nearly as accurate as the later lever escapement. But one has to realise that for a, a period of history, it didn't really matter that the escapement wasn't particularly accurate, because watches operated at a, a relatively low beat rate, and also operated with a relatively limited accuracy for the balance as well, and so there wasn't really much demand. But once really very, uh, very accurate balances and balance springs were developed, there became a need to update the escapement. And so came the invention of Thomas Mudge's lever escapement in 1750, which really did revolutionise the way these escapements work, and has remained largely unchanged to the present day as an extremely reliable and, albeit some might argue, slightly flawed technology, but one which works incredibly reliably and, and really is a fantastic breakthrough. And the way this escapement worked was that the spring of the watch, the main spring, would, would turn through a number of gears, this escape wheel. And the escape wheel was collect connected to the balance wheel, which I've just spoken about, by this, so this pallet fork, which came in the form um, of the, the key component of this escapement. And whilst trying to turn, this uh, escape wheel would impart a sliding motion, a sliding force, to one of those pallets, which are those, those jewels on that fork. And these would serve to impart uh, an impulse, an energy, to the balance wheel to keep it moving. But the, uh, the, the result of this was that the balance wheel, whilst moving, would in turn move that pallet back and forth on its central pivot to lock and unlock the escape wheel. And what this meant was that it could give a regular release of energy, which would then be, be released through a number of gears to move the hands. And I feel the genius of the lever escapement in its simplicity is seen when compared to, for example, the detent escapement, which is a brilliant technology without a shadow of doubt, but due to its complexity using that uh, detent spring um, and the, uh, the, the uh, more complicated build meant that it was, whilst more accurate than the lever escapement, was very complicated to assemble, and also, and this is the crucial point, was not self-starting. And this was a crucial point, because whereas a clock, even if it was, for example, a C clock, and thus was subjected to great movement, a clock was not subject to the same shocks which a watch would be. And so as a result, a, a, a watch which wouldn't restart after the balance was stopped by a sudden impact, 
was just not suitable for regular use. And certainly this has proven a major challenge for anyone trying to incorporate this style of escapement into a wristwatch, due to the, uh, the sheer complexity of the problem of trying to make a move uh, movement with a detent escapement work at all angles and during daily wear. Of course, the lever escapement has seen some development, and mostly this is to address its most predominant flaw. And this is the fact that it requires lubrication due to the fact that the, the impulse or the force imparted between the escape wheel and the pallet is one which is a sliding force rather than a pushing force. As a result, this means there is a, um, a certain amount of friction there, which does uh, both impact accuracy, but also does impact durability and, and, and wear in the long term. And this is an area where, for example, Harrison's Grasshopper Escapement did extremely well because it had a setup which was almost entirely friction-free, which was a, a very impressive leap. And of course, Harrison was an incredibly uh, impressive uh, clockmaker, and so his technology was able to be immensely accurate due to these features. But really, the most modern innovation to try and remove any sort of friction has been the Daniels Coaxial Escapement. And George Daniels' famous coaxial escapement, which is now, now fitted to, uh, to Omegas, and indeed, I reckon in the next few years will be fitted to all Omegas, reduces the, the friction to a bare minimum within the escapement through the use of three pallets and two escape wheels. And this changes the force from a sliding force to a pushing force, thus allowing the, um, the, the, the movement to run for very long periods of time without, uh, without the same maintenance as a normal lever escapement, and also to be able to run without lubrication. But I think what's crucial about these is that whilst this is a very major leap forwards in terms of accuracy and durability over the lever escapement, the fact the lever escapement has lasted for so long and still remains an extremely reliable solution does suggest its real greatness in the grand scheme of things and the world of everyday watchmaking. Now the next technology I'd like to speak about is more large scale and indeed more of a concept than a piece of technology, and this is the chronograph. And of all the complications one can have on a watch, with the possible exception of the date, the chronograph is the most popular and the most widespread complication over simply showing the time. And the chronograph has had an interesting history because for a great deal of history the chronograph was used not for the purposes one would see today. And indeed the first chronograph was invented in 1816 by Louis Moinet for astrological purposes and could measure 1 60th of a second by running at 30 hertz or 216,000 vibrations per hour. Now to put that into context, most modern mechanical movements run between 18,000 vibrations per hour, or 2.5 hertz, and, and 36,000 vibrations per hour, or 5 hertz, thus demonstrating just the, the sheer uh, rate at which this movement had to run. Now it should be noted this wasn't a timekeeper, so much as simply a chronograph or stopwatch, and so as a result didn't have the same needs for, for, con for complex durability and reliability as one sees in a wristwatch. But the next chronograph created came in 1821, when in December, Nicolas Riosec, the watchmaker and clockmaker to the king, Louis XVIII, in France, used his own chronograph to time the races, uh, the horse races in Paris in the Champ de Mars. And famously, this chronograph was encased in a box and didn't work in the same way as Louis Moine's. Instead, this chronograph worked with an ink needle and so thus couldn't be reset in the same way as a modern chronograph could, but certainly this marked another stage in the use of a timing tool for timing short periods of time in high accuracy. One could argue, though, that the first modern chronograph came in the form of the 1913 release of the Longines 13.33Z. And this is a movement which was seen as, uh, as a very modern monopusher chronograph from Longines, and was seen in some versions as a sort of form of wristwatch, with articulated lugs and leather strap. And of course, in this period and time, uh, albeit slightly pre-war for this watch, there was a time of, uh, of, of real technological advance, and so it's unsurprising that brands look to the chronograph as a solution. And in 1915, one saw the, the evolution of this style as well, with Breitling releasing their own wrist-mounted chronograph, again adding to the, the importance and the value of the wrist chronograph as a, a functional tool. Then it is worth noting that uh, Longines developed this, this concept later into their, their world-famous 13ZN flyback chronograph in the 1930s, and this is re recognised by a number of people as the greatest chronograph ever made, and so it does demonstrate the rapid advance of this technology. And of course the most major then change seen with the chronograph was when automatic chronographs became available. Because it should be noted that until the late 1960s, automatic chronographs simply hadn't seen development. Now there was some attempt to develop some automatic chronographs in the mid-40s, but due to minimal demand and interest, this ended up falling through. 
And so by 1969, one saw three groups really working to create an automatic chronograph first, and this story has been recounted many, many times. But to give my short, uh, short story and version of this, one had really the Zenith El Primero, which is described as the first automatic chronograph, and certainly, at least in my eyes, is the most refined of those released in 1969. It ran at the high beat rate of 36,000 vibrations per hour, allowing you to uh, time uh, time uh, time periods accurately to one fifth or, or or up to one tenth of a second. One also had the fact that this watch was a, a true ground up build, and so the chronograph was built uh, integrated with the automatic winding, and so not built as a separate module. But then one also had two other movements: the Caliber 11, which was produced by with by a collaboration of Buren, Hamilton, Breitling, Dubois de Pra, um, as well as Hoyer. And this movement had a modular design, so it had an automatic movement which was fitted with a, a chronograph module. And this is also seen in some Hoyer, Hoyers, such as the, the Hoyer Monaco, for instance. And then we have the Sago 6139, which some describe as having come out earlier than the other two movements, and was, was indeed uh, the first automatic movement um, with a chronograph to go into space. But of course the early 70s also brought on the creation of several really revolutionary movements, with the with Omega developing their caliber 1040, i.e. the Lamania 1340, which really proved to Omega that they had to create new automatic movements because converting older movements was a too expensive, and uh, and b also created extremely complicated movements. But this allowed one to have uh, movements such as the Lamania 5100, which created a really impressive line of uh, of extremely durable and and very resistant movements, which lasted the test of time with central minutes in addition to a period when the Velu 7750 was created as one of the very first computer-designed movements, thus creating a, another incredibly reliable and world-recognised automatic chronograph movement. And then of course today we have the, the really advanced line of modern movements, such as the Omega 9900, where one sees a coaxial escapement movement with silicon parts, a very long power reserve, and, uh, and a build which is, is fundamentally modern, really pushing automatic chronographs towards the future, and I think creating the next step and next stage in the development of this, uh, this, this type of watch. And before I move on to the penultimate technology I'd like to speak about, I think it's worth noting two key components of the chronograph. Now the first is the clutch, and the clutch is the area where the chronograph's gears and a gear train links to the rest of the movement, and this is seen either a lateral or a vertical clutch. Now both of the movements which you'll see during this explanation have lateral clutches, and that's to say the Omega 1861, and then a version of the A. Langenzurner L951 seen in the datagraph. And a lateral clutch involves uh, meshing the gears as is described by the name, horizontally, and this is described as the more beautiful um, appearance, certainly looking at the way the gears mesh, and, uh, and is perhaps the more old-fashioned style, but one does also ver see vertical clutches, which are described in many ways as being more modern styles of engagement, where the gears are already partially partially engaged, and so one doesn't have have quite the same change in uh, in the strain on the gear train, and so the accuracy tends to be slightly better, although in fairness the difference is pretty negligible. The one key difference, though, between these two movements is their method of start starting, stopping, and resetting the chronograph, because the Omega uses a type of cam, whilst the the Elang and Zuna uses a, 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 a column wheel. And the difference is that a CAM is a, a more modern solution, has been used more regularly in more modern chronographs, because it's a less expensive solution to engineer, and, uh, and, and provides a very adequate functionality. Now, this technology is, um, is certainly something which doesn't give quite the finesse of, of engagement of the chronograph, whereas a column wheel with its rotating style of, uh, of crenellated wheel allows a very crisp start, stop, and reset to the chronograph. Although one point I will make is that I would argue that a well-made cam is still better than a badly made column wheel, and so both have their merits, um, but certainly there is a difference in terms of the way they operate. The penultimate technology I'd like to speak about is quartz, and quartz is, in my eyes, the most revolutionary change ever seen to watchmaking. I think the magnitude of this change can't be understated, because it truly rocked the, uh, the, the, the industry to its core, in terms of, of, of renovating its perspective on, uh, on the way watches worked, and provided a, a wildly different perspective to what was previously viewed as high accuracy. And quartz watches work in uh, a generally very prescribed way, and came in the 1960s when microchips became available, and thus made it possible to be able to make a highly accurate quartz movement. Now, these work in terms of having a battery which provides a current to a microchip, 
and this passes a current through a tuning fork shaped quartz crystal inside tube. And through this current it oscillates at a given rate, and this is usually 32,768 Hz, and that equates to 32 or so kilohertz. And I say usually because there have been some examples of movements which, pursuing higher accuracy, have gone much higher than this, such as some omegas um, in the, the late 20th century, which really pushed the edge of the envelope to a point where actually their batteries couldn't last more than about 10 months, where they moved into the megahertz range, so that's a thousand times um, faster already than kilohertz. And this constant rate of oscillation is then detected again by that microchip, which then converts that to a one hertz impulse, which, uh, which it transfers to a stepping motor, which powers and, and turns the gears, which in turn turns the hands at a given rate. And really, the only outside influence which these are very susceptible to is temperature. And this is why for more elaborate and more expensive movements, such as those of Grand Seiko, one sees movements which are thermocompensated to be able to make up for this difference and change in temperature, and thus allow the movements to run accurately within five seconds a year. And the first publicly available quartz watch was the 1969 Seiko Quartz Astron, which famously was produced in, uh, in very small numbers in gold, and cost 450,000 yen, which was the equivalent of a car at the time. But the evolution of the quartz movement really re revolved around the development of electronics in the 1960s. And really there were three challenges um, working for the, uh, for the creation of the first quartz watch, as electrical watches had been produced beforehand, but didn't offer the, the, the advantages that quartz would later on. And these were America, Japan, and Switzerland. And America had had some development of electrical watches in the 1950s, and of course Seiko was very much on to creating these movements in the 60s. And there really was this ongoing battle at, uh, at timing competitions between Seiko and brands like Longines and producing their own quartz movements. But there was also the Centre Electronique Horloger, founded in 1962, which is a body of roughly 20 Swiss brands which serve the purpose of creating ele electronic watches in collaboration with each other and as a, a direct fight for Seiko. And by 1967, this group was able to develop movements such as the Beta 1 and the Beta 2, which eventually led to the Beta 21 in 1970, which was actually sold in watches such as the Rolex 5100. However, these movements were notoriously complicated, especially in their early stages, and just didn't lead to the same, same result as that Seiko movement. But really, the proof of the importance of the quartz movement is seen today in the fact that it's seen everything from £5 watches that one sees in a market, all the way up to the, the works of quite remarkable watchmaking of F.P. Journe, where quartz has really been revolutionised to create something new and thoroughly interesting. The final technology I'd like to speak about is arguably the simplest from a, uh, a direct perspective in terms of our interaction with it on a day-to-day -day basis, and this is the sapphire crystal. Because prior to the 1970s, the options for crystals for watches were relatively limited. The vast majority of crystals in previous decades had been acrylic, or indeed any sort of plexiglass. And plexiglass and acrylic have a hardness, a Mohs hardness, of 3 to 4, which means that they have a, a lesser hardness than steel, for example, and scratch very easily. Now, of course, one still sees some acrylic crystals on modern watches because they have this warm tone to them, and also because they don't shatter in the same way as true glass does, thus allowing them to be, to be more suitable to environments when, when they might be bumped, for example. However, by the 1970s, there were starting to be other options on the market for crystals which were much more scratch-resistant, which was really a need which was far more pressing than resistance to being knocked, which was rare for a watch anyway. And so the first was a mineral crystal, and this was seen on the Mark series Speedmaster from Omega, for example, which needed a flat crystal. And these had a hardness of 6 to 7 on the Mohs scale, meaning they were resistant to most, most damage and abrasions, but still didn't have quite the hardness that one needed to be able to resist scratches almost entirely. And so in the early 1970s, some watches, such as the, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, started to offer sapphire crystals. And Rolex started to use these, in fact, in the early 1980s, as a solution and alternative to the heavily raised acrylic crystals seen on previous decades watches. And of course the advantages of sapphire, or at least synthetic sapphire, were immense, because no one had a Mohs hardness of 9, which just underneath diamond was far far greater than the 5 or 6 that one saw from iron and steel, and so as a result was able to resist most abrasions and scratches seen during daily wear. And really to this day the only damage point which one often sees to sapphire crystals is where another crystal or piece of jewellery, for example, has bumped against the crystal and caused a deep scratch. Of course, surface abrasions are caused by small particles that might, uh, might land on the crystal, which are that hard, but certainly the vast majority of scratches could be removed and negated entirely by this high hardness. 
And the creation of these crystals has remained um, something of a, an important feature, and becomes more and more important as screens now are made with a sapphire crystal as well. And this is performed by putting um, um, aluminium oxide powder, as well as uncrystallized sapphire, and a sapphire seed, so an initial crystalline form of sapphire, into a crucible, and then heating it up to uh, temperatures which exceed 4000 degrees Fahrenheit in certain circumstances. And under these circumstances, the, uh, the aluminium oxide is able to crystallize into synthetic sapphire, and so one's able to have a, uh, a, a sort of a cylinder, if you will, of sapphire in this form. And the crystallization process takes place as the cylinder cools down over a long period of time after it's been heated. From this, slices of sapphire are taken, which are then mostly mechanically, but sometimes also by hand, polished uh, into the shape that one needs for a crystal. So a flat crystal is going to be the more simple, whilst for the, the most bubble-domed of crystals, one sees uh, more processes taking place. And certainly this is a part of a watch which is almost entirely ignored, apart from its technical advantages to making life a lot easier if you wear a watch every day, not to have to worry about these scratches so much. And of course nowadays they're also fitted with anti-reflective coatings, seen on both the inside and the outside of the crystal, depending upon whether one wants a more uh, scratch-resistant surface on the outside, or if one's willing to sacrifice that in favour of, uh, of better visibility. And these serve to break down the, the difference in optical density of the, the crystal and the air underneath the crystal and above it, thus allowing uh, less reflections to, uh, to form on the surface of the crystal. But certainly I feel this deserved a place in this video as an important technology and something which we appreciate every day but uh, seldom think about. And so I'll conclude this video here, but do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of my, uh, my choices to include in this video, and also if there's anything you might have mentioned that I haven't. And if you did enjoy the video then do please like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to see more videos and content here in the future. Also, do follow me on Instagram to be able to see more videos um, and, and details from my channel there, and, and also more horological photography. So thank you very much for watching. This is Zana Watch Guy, out.